Waitangi Day 2022, we celebrate, we commemorate Mana Wahine. people like that, don't we, Trina? Yeah, yeah. Oh, you know all your sisters and your aunties. Because you know sometimes, oh, sometimes you're going to come out singing. Sometimes you're going to come out fighting. Sometimes you do nothing at all. Sometimes you're going to feel like laughing. Sometimes you're going to feel like fighting.
lots of warrior women, don't we, Trina? We do. And tonight for this Waitangi Day special, we are hosting a conversation with some women who've been rattling the cages in their respective spaces. So, you know, some of us, we came to it late in life. I watched um, Bastion Point and the Land March on television, didn't really understand what was going on until I went to university and started to join the dots. And it's been a long trajectory, a long journey for many of us. But the conversation is really important and it's getting really exciting. So this next song, Treaty, from our second album, Rua, was co-written with Bennett Pormana. And uh, I still find it highly relevant and inspiring because it reminds me of all the people that have been involved in this long journey to get to where we are and how far we've got to go. Red percent, red, white and black from the abyss He replied to a pair who cover the land like mist Adama i te po, uri uri ki te ao marama Hear the voice of tipu na echo Throughout the valley, on our way back In 1840, attacking our peace Spirituality, self-autonomy Fought for with a vengeance Resurrect to seek justice So upliftment is assured Takahia Separated, segregated From my culture destroyed from within Deprived of heritage in the system Swearing allegiance to the queen of the England Tino ranga tira tanga is what you hear From tanga to whenua for sure See bear, we much cause we care Got a hunger for knowledge and global consciousness Sing it now Jane Kelsey, law professor, public intellectual, and early Pākehā supporter of the Tino Rangatiratanga movement, widely regarded as an ally and champion, with a history of challenging both the Crown and her students to think more critically. Kia ora, Jane. Kia ora. Now, how familiar were you with the treaty when you were growing up? Oh, I wasn't familiar at all. I think it wasn't really until I was overseas studying, because when I went to law school, we had one lecture on the treaty in the whole of my law degree, and that was about the English text. Okay. So when I was overseas studying, my dad sent me a clipping of the evictions at Bastion Point. Hmm. And that was the wake-up moment. So, you know, a lot of um, Pākehā find talk of the treaty triggering. Why aren't you threatened by it? I don't think threatens a really helpful idea. I mean, you, you've really got to work out, firstly, who you are and where you come from. 
to make sense of things that are happening around you. In law, you know, I came back to teach at the university when the Hekaua incident happened at the university with the Haka party. It followed the Bastion Point uh, occupation and evictions. There were the Waitangi protests. There was the Springbok tour. And the law was at the centre of it. So you, you couldn't do law without understanding the relationship between Titi and law because it was happening all around you. But I remember when I first met you, I was at law school and there were no conversations really about the treaty and constitutional law. I mm. think I asked a question and they said, well, if it's not embedded in legislation, then we don't really deal with it. Mm. So mm. did that change in your tenure, throughout your tenure? Yeah, I think it was a part of a moment, a really important moment in the history of Aotearoa because we'd had the 70s and the 80s full of protests. We have to remember that it was the protest movements that actually put on the front page the issues that should have been discussed for decades and a century and a half. And, and so it was a time which forced you to confront those realities. Now, you have long been an ally and a champion and worked alongside some of our most formidable and articulate um, activists, I guess. How do you navigate those relationships so you don't get offside with them and you stay in your lane? Because some Pākehā are worried about that. They want yeah, to yeah. join in, but, you know, a bit anxious. Well, I mean, you screw up. Um, you make mistakes, you learn from mistakes. Hopefully over time you build enough trust in you that when you screw up, you are given that chance to, to learn and do things better. Uh, but I think there's a, there's a couple of really important um, challenges. Um, one is to remember what your role is. The role of, of Pākehā in the treaty context is firstly to empower Māori. It's not to speak for Māori. It's to know where the boundaries are. And if there's an Indigenous to Indigenous kōrero, then that's not a place for you. At the same time, it, it's working out how to talk truth to your own power. Um, and that includes challenging the Crown, bringing your voice to challenge those who purport to speak for you when they don't. Mm. So over the years, the conversation around the treaty has changed a lot. I remember a time when it was, the treaty is a fraud, then it went to honour the treaty. Now there's a lot of conversation around um, various, the interpretations of various texts and the principles. What are the challenges that those present to us? <laughs> the starting point has to be understanding what Māori expected when they entered into that covenant to allow Queen Victoria to bring some of her own people here. And that was to continue as they were with the benefits of those who came. And, and we have to keep that in mind because it's a win-win. So for those of us who understand what the treaty is about and why it's good for everybody, the big challenge is the how. I think the how differs depending on what you bring to the challenge. Yeah. So those of us who are lawyers have certain skills that we can bring. Those who work in communities can um, work in those communities, whether it's through um, social projects or working with the marae or, uh, or the kura uh, or their own school to introduce biculturalism and deal with history and so on. So I think we need to think about what our particular responsibilities and contributions can be. Uh, we're doing some projects at the moment that involve a treaty audit of various things that are being done, not trusting the Crown to do the audit. Because they often audit themselves about the breaches that they've committed, which doesn't make a lot of sense. Well, they do, and they compound the breaches because they reinterpret their treaty obligations in ways that retains their power. For us as Pākehā, there are enormous pluses and benefits for us to understand our Māori and to find ways to work with Māori to advance Aotearoa. And so that is the message and the challenge to next generations. I'd vote for you, but you'd never stand, would you? No, I'm not a party girl. Okay.
Not that kind of party. Uh, our next guest is Chloe Swarbrick. Chloe Swarbrick, the second Greens MP to ever win an electorate seat. Won Jacinda Ardern, twice failed to turn red. A vocal advocate for legalising cannabis, Chloe is her party's spokesperson across 11 portfolios and passionate about inclusivity. Chloe, what did you understand about the treaty when you were going through school? Not all too much. Uh, so I was born in 1994, so I was 10 years old when the foreshore and seabed protests were happening and that law was going through Parliament. Uh, I remember that a lot of the adults around me um, were really freaked out and that there were a lot of discussions uh, about things being taken away or people not being able to access things like the beaches. But I, yeah, then got into actually the very privileged space of law school and that was the first time that I finally started learning about Te Tiriti o Waitangi. It was not something that was on the table accessible or available to all young people and that's why I'm really excited about New Zealand history now being available in schools. But I think that that, as a first step, will help to dispel some of the, the fear that comes from perhaps not knowing the full extent of our history and what's played out. When you presented your maiden speech, mm. you talked about um, systems being designed for people who look like me mm. um, and the importance of inclusivity. Um, how have you tried to help redesign the systems? Mm. A large part of that looks like sitting down, shutting up and, and trying to listen <laughs> where you can, um, but also being really cognizant of the fact that by virtue of the privilege of my position and my platform that I do have a role to use that proactively in certain spaces, particularly actually when it comes to other Pākehā. There is a role for Pākehā in educating other Pākehā and working through that because they are not the people who are subjected to, you know, oppressive mm -hmm. systems. Uh, and that, I think, is the only way that we can work through some of this polarity that's currently playing out. And, you know, in its worst instances, that's where we get conspiratorial theories, as we heard around the likes of Hipopua. Oh, my goodness gracious, yes. So, Chloe, um, one of the challenges, of course, is to move beyond rhetoric and into mm. action. How do you model a treaty relationship in your organisation or your workplace? Yeah, within the organisation, uh, that would be the Green Party. Uh, mm. So a point's been made about the systems and structures that we operate in. Uh, within the parliamentary Westminster colonial system, you've got 120 votes. You need at least 61 to change any law or taxation system or structure or whatever else. When it comes to particularly the treaty settlements, uh, we have it as a matter of course that we will consistently put on record that there's no such thing as full and final. And I find the very notion of full and final quite ironic and hilarious unto itself because the Crown will always be the first to admit that that financial recompense is never going to be yeah, recompensed for what's occurred. So can we have a conversation about the treaty without having one about neoliberalism and capitalism and all the other isms? Well, it has to be about colonisation and colonialism because they are all manifestations of that same model. And I'm sorry, Chloe, but the system of the Crown as it is, until that system is prepared to actually, or forced to share power in a real sense, we're not going to resolve any of those isms. Mm. And we um, need to mobilise people to actually think that that's going to be a great idea. So I'm going to bring in my next guest now, Dame Susan Devoy. Dame Susan Devoy, the former number one ranked squash player, holder of four World Open titles, who in 2013 was a controversial selection as the New Zealand Race Relations Commissioner, a role she describes as incredibly revealing. Your role as race relations conciliator, what was the main kind of learning that you took from that? That's a very strange position, to be perfectly honest, I can say that now. Um, I remember when I first started in the role, I was advised never to use the word racist. But, so, pardon? But your title was... I know, I know, because that would engender all sorts of very difficult conversations. I was also told at the time by the Chief Commissioner that I was responsible for every other race in New Zealand except for Māori. Who, who was responsible for the Māori then? Well, we had a part-time uh, Indigenous Commissioner. So 
you can understand how problematic my role was in the very first place, you know. So I'm not making excuses for the good and bad things I did and whether I stuffed it up or did whatever, you know. Um, but going into an environment like that when you think, what is your role, and you get instructed with those things at the very first place, you're going to think, well, if the Race Relations Commission is confused, imagine how everyone else is going to feel. But, so what have I learned? If I was to look, and I can now, because I've soul-destroying, stashed them on my computer somewhere, all the complaints that came to me personally, and I was expected to reply to them, I would say 75% of it was a sentiment of anti-Māori and anti-treaty. From Pākehās, of course. From everything, anything and everything as small as I resent being called a Pākehā, too much, you know, bigger and perhaps more important issues that you could have a frank discussion about. But, so what does that say? So that says to me that that's where we are as a country. People are very, very anti-Māori and very anti-treaty. Well, when I say very, that hasn't gone away. Mm. It's still there. How did you and what did you learn about the treaty and those kinds of relationships while you're in that position? I think it was, and what I think is really important about going forward is, is having experiences. You know, whilst I'd been on Marais and so many Kiwi haven't. Yeah. So many Kiwi don't understand about Parihaka. You know, so many, and that's why I think um, what I learned about the treaty was it's it's a really positive thing. And the average New Zealander sees you know, colonisation as a dirty word as well because... It's something in the past. Well, they don't understand it. So we've got to actually, as well as education in our schools uh, for our children, which is, you know, that's how you change a generation, which is really important, but that education also needs to be about the entire New Zealand history. So not just about Māori and the treaty because, you know, we're going to go forward and miss out all the other good bits of our Chinese, of our, you know, Muslim communities and that, but the treaty is something that is never described as being... Well, not never, because um, we all come from... But for the... I'm always talking about Joe Bloggs here. Yeah. Um, I think it's important. Yeah. Yeah, it's just, you know, because these are the people that we have to bring along in the conversation. So, you know, if everybody had the opportunity to go to a treaty settlement, you know, you even if you were the worst redneck racist in the whole of the country, you couldn't help but feel powerfully and emotional about you know, what's happened there and what the good that will bring to the people. Mm. You know, I want my children, my grandchildren, to grow up knowing that if we address the inequities for Māori and Pacifica and everybody else, then that's good for everyone. Mm. That's going to make Aotearoa a much better country. How would a treaty-compliant or focused Aotearoa make a positive difference to Pākehā, Jane? It will give us a completely different toolkit to deal with the challenges that confront us. Yeah. Um, whether we're dealing with the climate crisis or we're dealing with health or we're dealing with housing, homelessness, job creation. And, and what we've been talking about here is a challenge that is urgent. But it is not a challenge that those who have power are currently prepared to engage. How do we bring people on board, Susan, in terms of understanding that the treaty and power sharing is a good thing for all New Zealanders, not just Māori, but for Pākehā and uh, immigrants that come in? Well, I think I agree with Jane. You know, unless the people we put in charge to govern us actually make some very tough decisions, but they're too scared to. You know, I look at it and I look at all the different government organisations around that are, you know, trying really hard to be good treaty partners, OK? But it's all just a ad hoc, tick box, tokenistic. Some do it really well, some do it really badly. And I look at examples when you sit around and all the park air in the room are like shit scared, you know, because they're shit scared they're going to get it wrong. Uh, and then you go to, to another organisation, they do it completely differently. And I'm not saying a one-size-fits-all everything, but Let's have a really authentic go. Let's get some really good examples of good kopapa around treaty partnership. But I agree with Jane, you know, and I'm going to lose a whole lot more friends over this, that unless our politicians, our government are powerful enough to actually enforce or make sure that this 
that there is a real genuine Crown partnership, it's not going to change. And this is your challenge, mm. Chloe, working in this space as an advocate, this machinery, uh, the parliamentary machinery, the Crown, it's a big beast and it seems to be always concerned with the next election. How challenging is that for you? I look around the chamber and I think on a day-to-day -day basis there is this seesawing effect or this kind of binary choice between either trying to facilitate the change that all of us ostensibly believe in or progressing one's career. And, you know, I see some people making those decisions to progress their career in a way that they're going to sit down, shut up and wait 10 years to have an opinion by which time they might not know what they believe anymore. And that's why I'm really inspired by looking at the kind of moves back to or the renaissance, <laughs> hopefully we get more and more of it, of, you know, the stuff that happened before I was born in the 70s and the 80s, of people coming together. But there has been a structural attempt to undermine all of that through destabilising the unions, even the student unions and associations, through ridiculing uh, and normalising the ridicule of protest. Oh, pie. What's your response to people who complain about the treaty and Māori and racism? I think just breathe, you know, and actually just unpack what you're saying and what you're thinking and what is, why are you like that? But, you know, I remember um, Ranganui Walker telling me and taking me actually into his bedroom, I know that sounds a bit weird, but he's got his whole whakapapa, all his, you know, whānau on the wall and there's Chinese and Māori and Japanese and whatever and funny that we're in a bedroom and Deirdre was there too, and he said, you know, race relations is happening in the bedrooms. And it's quite right. So I sometimes say to these people, you know, your mokum, your grandchild might be Māori or Chinese or whatever. Do you want them growing up and having to face the types of conversations that we're having now? Thank you so much, Dame Susan Devoy, Professor Jane Kelsey and Chloe Swarbrick. We're saltwater people. Our ancestors came here to Aotearoa, New Zealand on various waka, uh, whether it's our waka like Te Arawa from Hawaii or some of the big sailing ships that came out of Europe and England even more recently. They always came not quite knowing what they were getting into, what was at the end of that great voyage. So they must have come with hope, but a lot of trepidation. Calling you celebrates their courage. Soon be back, we're coming back this way. I'm feeling so pleased about it I feel like sailing Across the seas beneath the great divide I feel all my ancestors Ship ahoy, we've come this far today. I'm feeling so pleased about it. I feel like sailing across the seas beneath the great divide. I feel all my ancestors who cut the
ora. I'm absolutely delighted to be seated with these wonderful women. I know we're going to turn on television. Some people go, oh, my God, what are they up to? Um, and we want to have a conversation about the treaty and what it means to each of us and what transformation might look like, but more importantly, how we get there, which is the challenging bit. What was your experience of the treaty growing up? Ella Henry, funny, fierce, an accomplished academic and media commentator, former treaty negotiator, and now, as a doting grandmother, more driven than ever. I didn't have a lot of experience of the treaty growing up. It was not something we talked about in our family. We were a very poor family and really survival was our key issue. I didn't start learning about it till I went to university in the 80s. Was that the same for you, Annette? Annette Sykes, armed with te tiriti and a firm sense of justice, moves effortlessly between community, courtrooms and tribunal. No sign of slowing down. No, um, my grandmother was a graduate of um, Queen Victoria and she was uh, ducks there. So te tiriti informed her life she was a member of the Ratana Church um, after all of our stand were, land was stolen um, from the peoples of Ngāti Mākino, and my mother's sister married a survivor of the Māori Battalion, uh, Te Whiwhi Mea, and he reminded us of the price of citizenship he played and how Te Tiriti informed his decision as a young man to enlist. So it was part of our everyday discussion. Uh, and what followed was the Pākehā oppression, notwithstanding the promises of Te Tiriti, um, that was constantly occurring um, as we were growing up. Hmm. Now, you both of you have law degrees. Julia, why did you go to law school? And was there more discussion around the treaty then? Julia Faiporti, lawyer and advocate for systemic change across the criminal justice system and beyond. A young mother passionate about connecting the dots. It was my first exposure to the treaty when I went to law school. But in going there, it really exposed me to the the political discussions around the treaty and the experiences of going to predominantly quite a Parker institution and learning about things and how they impact Māori, not from our not from our own mouths, is what I was exposed to. And that's what that's really my grounding or starting point from learning about about the treaty. Did you feel conflicted when you were studying law, either of you, because law was used as a tool of colonisation? I had this conversation with just as Joe Williams, you said, oh, well, it can be used as a tool for decolonisation. Did you have a problem with that? Well, for me, actually, I, it was actually probably my second year, I saw a panel with um, Annette and Matuamwana Jackson talking about uh, the law and the tools of the law and also the oppression and the reality that our whānau have experienced. And it really hit me quite hard um, while I was a tauira to go, am I doing the right thing? Because this sounds like a bit of a, a bugger of a tool that's really hurt our whānau, but it's really driven me further, actually, to, to grab that tool and use it for us. Mm. What about you, Annette? Oh, I went into the law, eyes wide open, after the Springbok tour. I was actually going to do a degree in economics. Um, the oppression of our people and seeing great fighters like um, Hilda and Horne uh, John Minto and Trevor, um, Trevor um, motivated me to participate in the law. And then in the first lecture, the treaty tri 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 wasn't mentioned. It was only the Treaty of Waitangi, and it was one line. So from there on, then it shaped how I was going to um, not use it as a tool of de decolonisation, but transform the system so that it is the constitutional framework from which all of this law should be consistent with. Mm. So, Mika... What was your um, relationship with the treaty prior to going into Parliament? Mika Whaitiri. She's the former sports star and treaty negotiator who's moved out of the iwi space and into the parliamentary chamber. After working as a senior policy advisor, Mika has been the MP for Te Ikaroa Rāwhiti since 2013. Um, as a 10-year-old uh, working up the coast of my uh, uncle's sharing gang, uh, it was 1975, and I was sick. I was 10, and we heard about the land march that Fenner was leading and the offshoots uh, that were happening in our patch. And so my uncle got the whole gang out of the back of the truck, and we marched. Uh, I was 10. I, I didn't know what it was about. All I knew it was about protecting Māori land rights, um, and that probably triggered something in me. Wasn't taught 
treaty in school, and I too uh, went to Vic Law School, failed, um, but uh, that triggered my interest, having uh, moved around with people like uh, Justice Joe Williams, uh, who lectured me, and of course, uh, Karen, uh, that's also in the Māori Land Court, and of course, I remember um, um, Aotearoa and their famous maranga, Ake Ai, and, and I remember yeah. going to a function on, I even remember the year, 86, 87, and watch this young activist from Waikato University get up and say, honour the treaty, and that person was Moana Maniapoto. Oh, stop it. <laughs> stop it. There you go. Hey, um, hey Hilda, the, the discussion used to be the treaty was a fraud. Then it seemed to move to honour the treaty, and then it's talked, we talk about the principles and people dissect the texts. Um, and then it seemed to be a lot of activists started to move into parliament. Um, can you comment on that sort of a change in thinking and strategy? Hilda Hulkyard Harawira, a stalwart of the Tenoranga Tiritanga and Black Women's Movement since the day she challenged university students over their mock haka. Now a driving force behind Kura in her community. I suppose there's been a lot of phases about um, treaty education. I started learning about it when I was about year six, the times table and the treaty as a project. But um, I think it went through phases. The first phase I learned was the crown view and, and the treaty was like that. I mean, and, and when I became a member of Ngā Tamatō, everything pointed back to the treaty. Um, and after the land march, the Bastion Point, there's all this awareness gathering and, like, y y when you listen to all the wānanga and the debates, everything comes back to the treaty, the bad uh, results, the bad data, that, you know, blah, blah, blah. And so I think it's gone through a lot of phases and we've been part of decolonising some of the lies about the treaty that have been perpetuated. <coughs> and for me, uh, the... Ngāpui claim in 10, 2010 when I learnt that um, actually Ngāpui and Muri Whenua only signed Te Triti or, or Waitangi, you know, where we all had believed, this, swallowed this big lie that, you know, we were breaking the Treaty of Waitangi. So, so those messages have changed over time and, and some have become more acceptable, but they're all right. Mm -hmm. <laughs> they're all correct in their own way. Yeah, so Ella... Um, one of the challenges is to help people understand that the relevance of the treaty in their lives. So if you think about your whānau up north and how do you join the dots or help people join the dots between te treaty and their daily lives as whānau struggling, challenged in life? I mean, I don't think anybody has the ideal answer to that question. And one of the things I'm heartened by is that as a nation, we're working through those very questions. Um, Pākehā and Māori, te tiriti and treaty discourse around how we do that, how we, how we operationalise partnership and equity and fairness as a nation when most of the rest of the countries in the world don't do it very mm. well. So, so we do have something of a mandate in this country which Māori are intrinsically woven to. So what does that mean for me and for our whānau in the north is, is to be able to live our best life means that we can live in a fair community and society and how, how we do that by being part of the political structure, being part of the media, being part of the law, being mm. educators. You, you know, we as a people have survived 3,000 years of discovery in the Pacific. We've had less than 200 years of colonisation. It's like a bad month. Mm, a very bad month, yes. Annette, you've been to the Waitangi Tribunal. How many times do you reckon? Well, I was the first Māori woman lawyer to argue the Te Reo Māori claim, so oh. I must have done between 50 to 60 cases in the last 40 years. Um, I was there to start the fish case, broadcasting case, the Te Reo Māori case. Recently, I was there to challenge their racist practices in Oranga Tamariki. Um, I was there for five years arguing about free trade agreements. So you name it, I've been there. And in a whole range of contexts, I think we've managed to spotlight what's going wrong. The recommendations have been made, but every Crown, with, doesn't matter which government, has been reluctant 
to follow the recommendations to honour to treaty. So the United Nations made commentary around that about concern about um, the fact that recommendations aren't binding and are rarely followed. So ha it's what is the point? That, it's worse than that. There are recommendations that are binding, like return forest land. And then um, you get findings to that effect. But it, because it's costing a billion dollars to have people have their forest land re returned, the Crown keeps arguing and arguing. It's worse than that. There is no real um, effort to honour structured agreements like people like Machirata, um, Sir Graham Latimer, argued for to get the Crown Forest Assets Act, to get the State Owned Assets, uh, Enterprises Act, and yet 40 years later, those particular clauses are being substituted by a veil of treaty settlement policies that deny true justice. So that's what's happening in that forum. To be fair, though, the uh, articulation of the rights and responsibilities now are of such pristine understanding that it's infiltrated so that now the Pākehā law has to confront the fact that Te Hanga Māori is LAW, and is equal to Pākehā law, and the constitutional framework of this country needs to adjust to that. Mm. Julia, in the spaces that you work in, justice and and with the state, the hearings under state care, what would what would uh, treaty focus New Zealand? How would that make a difference to the people that you work with? Because you're dealing with some very practical, immediate challenges, aren't you? Those challenges are the direct result of Te Tiriti not being on it and the abuses that have, and beyond Te Tiriti, just basic human rights and the oppression and lived experience of what colonisation is. It's not historical. It looks like our men and our women in our whānau in prisons. It looks like our children being stolen and severed from our whakapapa generation after generation. So there is a part where if we all of a sudden started honouring Te Tiriti, the Crown, Māori, our relationship, because I, I follow the relationship pathway, because Ngāti Pro didn't say sit at our table and have half the power to make decisions around Ngāti Pro, te mea, te mea. But even if that were to happen now, it would take a few generations to shift to shift those numbers and the experiences of our whānau, because it's been intergenerational trauma and harm, and it's going to take some intergenerational healing. But part of that fabric for change requires Te Tiriti to be honoured and to be practised and to be lived. Mm. And really, it needs to come from those in, that hold much of the power, which is the Crown. Things like the Tribunal, which I support, and I think our whānau need avenues to be heard. When those recommendations come out, it's still the Crown making the decisions about what to do with it. And for me, all the money in the putia, when we're talking about $1 billion, we spend over a $1 billion locking up our whānau in prisons every single year. And it's so where does the power sit? And for me, that's true, Te Tiriti. Um, that's where the structure needs to sit, where we have equal power mm. to make the decisions for ourselves. And we, we've come a huge way, and we still substantively have a long way to go. Ancestors was inspired by Ngaitahu, one of the very first iwi to settle in terms of their treaty claims. I was driving around the South Island with my friend, Dr. Te Maire Tau, and he was looking out the window with his map and he was singing this old waiata. And I said, what are you doing? He said, I'm trying to fit the names in this waiata with the actual descriptions and with the map that I'm staring at. So trying to bring alive the stories that were captured in the waiata with the landscape. And it reminded me that the names, the original names of all our maunga, our valleys and our awa all have a story attached to them. And when we use those names, we walk the talk of our ancestors.
So, Mecca, before you went to Parliament, mm. one of your roles was as a negotiator for treaty settlement. What did you learn from that process yourself in that role? Uh, never to trust the Crown, uh, that uh, you needed to push them really hard uh, to make sure uh, that you focused on who the true enemy was, uh, that you were never, ever, ever going to get your full compensation of what you lost. And so you had to prepare yourself. That didn't mean you conceded. It meant you had to go in with a really... You had to know how um, the Crown operated. And some of us in Long Whakata actually worked for the Crown. Some of our people thought us as kūpapa. But we used that expertise to then play it back on the Crown to get the best deal we possibly can. Are we happy with the deal? Of course, in hindsight, we could have done more. But we went in clearly knowing that um, this was our best shot of trying to recompense what we lost. We lost a million acres around Tūranga. Uh, we lost a lot of people through being shot at Ngātapa. We had a lot of people um, incarcerated to the Chathams with no trial. So it was horrific. And we're still paying the price that 45% of our male population got lost through that process. So, you know, with all that history and what has our Komatu has told us during that whole campaign, get the land. They didn't care the cost of it. They just said, get the whenua back. And mm. so those simple instructions as negotiators, you humble yourself, you engage with your people, but you stay very, very sharp on who's the enemy and you do whatever you can to get the best possible deal. That was my experience. Mm. And I try to take that when I've gone into Parliament. Sometimes I've been successful, sometimes I haven't. But you don't stop trying. Ella, can you relate to that? Absolutely. What was the key learning for you? Yeah. Absolutely. I, I mean, I, I can't help but agree with everything you've said because learning to understand the process and the system was fundamental to being able to survive a treaty settlement. But the reality is when you stand back and look at it, the thief is creating the rules of reconciliation. The thief is creating the infrastructure for recompense. So we can't expect anything more than we get. And anything we do get is so hard fought 
that sometimes it almost breaks the people who are part of the process. So it, it is a, a crushing process, but it's still essential. Like you, I think the whenua is important, but I also think the most important thing is the apology, the historical account, the truth of our history. Because when that is taught, when every New Zealander understands the truth of our history, then that is when the validation of the treaty will, and te tiriti will mm. happen. Mm. What, Hilda, what do you, what did Pākehā need to understand? Um, <laughs> I think, We're on the clock, I, I, I think, yeah, that uh, we should be focused on the, the constitution of Aotearoa um, embedding he haka putanga me te tiriti for our mokopuna, all our mokopuna, all our, we all love our mokopuna. And I don't want to say, e Pākehā mā, um, we'll wait to 2040 till you get over your racism. Um, I just think we need to do it quicker than that. If you can act to COVID, you can, you know the racism has been going on. I don't want to put any more submissions in front of you. I don't want to wait 40 years for you to throw your pennies at me. Just do it. Uh, whatever government's in, um, whoever gets rolled, I don't care. Uh, con you, you know, the fact that the Waitangi Tribunal recognised everything that Ngāpui's been saying for over 180 years is cool, but actually we knew that Ngāpui never, ever, ever, and Murifina never ceded sovereignty. So, yes, I'd like to have a constitution of Aotearoa on the plate, and I really want to ask Pākehā, Pacifica and other multi uh, racial communities to total total us. They don't. We don't dick around wasting time. Kia ora. Kaupai, lovely, well said as usual. Annette, we've been working in particular spaces over the years, and and our uh, friend uh, Moana Jackson has said one of the challenges is that incrementalism becomes stasis, and sometimes it almost looks like the end goal. So how do we? What's the how? How do we? How do we move forward with this kind of a kaupapa? So I would see that we need a decolonisation strategy, you know. Um, Australia, New Zealand and Canada still haven't committed to that, despite a whole lot of other um, countries doing it. That decolonisation strategy, it shouldn't be incremental. It's about sharing power. It's a transfer of power. It's about reconstitution and reimagining of a system of governance that Te Tiriti and He Whakaputunga contemplated as the relationship between the arriver settlers, Pākehā, my father's people, and Tangata Whenua, my mother's people. That dream, that reimagining can happen, as Hilda says, if there's a transfer of power. I look to the new generation. They believe in it. Frankly, um, I think our generation um, uh, 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 um, are behind the eight ball in the transformative change. So um, I'm Don't hoping... you see more allies and champions in, in park, among Pākehā now? Yeah, but they're allies and champions, but we still haven't had the power shift. Yeah. So, um, you know, I also see a lot more browning of the bureaucracy happening, a lot more Māori judges, a lot more Māori police, a lot more Māori politicians, but there's still no transfer of power. Why not? Is it because it's so comfortable to maintain our $200,000 salaries rather than actually seek real change and transformation? Well, if... I mean, politicians can say, hey, we're doing better than the other lot. Well, that's a low bar sometimes. Or they'll say, if we do too much, we'll get tossed out, and then you've got the other lot. So this, these competing election cycles can be stifling for movement forward, Mecca. Absolutely. Um, but it's just like the discussion we're having here. Um, there's, it's relative. Um, you know, just in my short time and the use of te reo on mainstream media. Now, that's not a measurement, but I'm just saying the nation is accepting that Māori do have a critical role to play in the fabric of this country. But to Annette's point, we need to shift and do a... And to Hilda's point, we need to do a quantum leap to the sh uh, power sharing. Now, can I sit here and say the government's ready to sign up? Um, the 15 of us argue that that's exactly what we want and that's exactly what the people are saying. But the reality is you've got the other four or so million folks out there that have got a different view, you know. And so it's not like saying we can't move here and we don't want to move here. We've got to make sure that the nation, that we bring the nation along with us. And that's why the message to the nine Māori, our Pacific brothers and sisters, is get on board on what Māori are trying to lead here. But and, and how do you do that? How do you do that, Julia? You're part of the young, articulate fabulous sword that's moving us forth. How do you convince people that this is a good thing for everybody, a treaty and constitutional transformation? Well, I think there's a couple of things. One of them is 
I think I'm closer to Rangata here, Jason. Oh, I'm getting there now. But it's from our, my, you know, tūkana who have walked before us that have gifted me an entitlement to be Māori and to be very proud of that and to be very unapologetic about that. So that's a strength that has come from those who have marched and had fights um, and are still fighting. So they've gifted that to our generation. So we can be so entitled. We can go on Facebook, we can do a live, we can say to the government, you need to change and you need to do this because we have the right to just be. To the point of even something on, like the personal is the political, deciding to take my, my mokokowai to naming our children after our tipuna. These are all actions we've inherited. In terms of the changes, we have to be, A, unapologetic and just be. And the second thing is keep pushing, um, keep pushing for change. But I think the, the power of colonisation is that it keeps us all in our lanes that was designed by the thief and it distracts us to try and fight for our people within those lanes, whereas we know our collective strengths. So we need Fano in Parliament, we need Fano and the government bureaucrats, we need our Fano doing the do on the ground um, with our Fano, um, with our community organisations. But we need the space to be talking together so that we have collective strategy and action so that we're not distracted by colonial institutions and kept in silo lanes where we're not going to be able to change those power structures. So it's all of those things, it's and, and. and I think I feel very hopeful that that, that that will happen and is happening because it has to happen. Otherwise, we, we give up on our mukupuna and our tūkana didn't give up on us and this is why we, we, are, we are here now. It, it's tiring. Yes. Hey, it's tiring, eh, <laughs> hey, mate? Mainga. Yeah. So, so, Ella, how do you model a treaty relationship in your workplace? You're at AUT, I'm, internally and externally? I'm... Maybe biased, but I, I'm, I'm fortunate, I believe, in that I'm, I work in an institution around education and I genuinely believe that education is the starting point. I'm still the first person in my old whānau to go to university. Mm. It transformed my life, it transformed the lives mm. of my children and hopefully my moko. And so once we move towards telling the truth of our history and with the changes that are envisaged in the education system right from primary upwards, I think that's going to contribute to the tipping point that's necessary. Um, essentially, tauiwi non-Māori need to understand that te tiriti is theirs as much as it is ours. It is not mm. a Māori thing. Mm. It is an Aotearoa New Zealand thing. And it gives them as many rights as it does us. And it gives them the responsibilities that it gives us. Absolutely. And when we all understand that, there is that transformational shift. So I'm, I'm proud to be part of an education sector that is part of that change in the same way that law and activism and politics. We, we have to have a united front, even if we disagree on, on points, you know, on, on various hypothetical points. The reality is, as Māori, as New Zealanders, we're moving in the same direction. I have to believe that because I want my moko to grow up in a different Aotearoa to the one that I was born in and my grandmother was born in. Annette, so one of the challenges is that Māori in those local spaces, iwi, leaders and all that, everyone's got so much on the table. They're dealing with... COVID, they're dealing with housing and poverty, and we're dealing with trying to be, to, to relate with, set up new relationships with the Crown. This is the stuff that's behind the door, in the boardrooms, the really boring stuff that doesn't hit the headlines, the actual mechanics of it. Can you comment on the challenge around that and how we cut through? I think it's really simple. Uh, it's about transfer of power. Now, I'll use water. The Crown knows that Māori own water, but they won't allocate the rights and interests of it to water. They have a system at the moment, though, that allocates the rights to use water, and Māori are at the back of the queue for our development needs for that. Now, simple solution. Confirm that Māori own rights and interests in water. We have values in Manakitanga. We're not going to stop sharing water with this country, but set up governance arrangements that have us in the power of those allocation issues. Real simple values... You know, uh, my Pākehā father was a neighbour to Tūhoi. They shared water for mutual survival, dairy farming him, them for their trees. There was m meetings going on locally, but there's a resistance nationally to actually give Māori the power over resources to affect change. The next, the next simple strategy is making sure the decolonisation corridor through all the schools, resourcing kōhanga reo, 
making sure we're not second-class institutions of learning. Kohanga Reo and Kura Kaupapa have not got the investment in their own structures, infrastructure, that is happening in the mainstream. Why not? Because mainstream has this inertia to change, and there's a mean-spiritedness to actually providing proper support for us. And so what, what are the values that we're asking the nation to think about? Aroha tetahi ki tetahi, manaki tanga for future generations, but more fundamentally recognising the power of our nation is built on values of that magnitude, not mean-spiritedness, and um, what um, she's right, boss, I'm up first. That's the transformation change at the personal level that will make the political change that's required. Mm, it's a multi-pronged attack, isn't it? Do we have the energy and enough people on board? Well, I have the energy. Everybody keeps saying, why do I keep doing what I'm doing? <laughs> uh, it's really simple. My grandmother told me to. Our land was stolen, so I got our lakes back. Mm -hmm. um, uh, our, my grandmothers were raped, so I got that story told. And we got apologies for it. It's real simple. You have the wherewithal within yourself, and you then just have to follow through and not get diverted by the coca colonization of this country. We need to be working with Papa Tonuku and each other to ensure our mutual survival, but more fundamentally to assert the rights of Tunuranga Tiratanga Mana um, Motuhake, Mana Whakahaere, Mana Whakaeke, that actually give all of this country, not just Māori, a right to call Aotearoa their home. Big thanks. Much aroha to Julia Whaiporti, Annette Sykes, Hilda Hulkyard Harawera, Ella Henry and Mika Whaiteri. Right now, in boardrooms, back rooms, cafes, school rooms, even in some government places, there are some people sitting down imagining a new way forward for Aotearoa New Zealand based on Te Tiriti. They see the treaty as our friend. There's so much to get excited about. The hard stuff is how we do it. And that's why we need the best brains on the job. We need everybody to get imaginative, to get creative, to talk with each other, to not be afraid because we can do this and we need to do it sooner than later. So if you're up for it, if you've got the courage, if you're a warrior woman or you're a man who's useful, please step up now and put your hands up and do something. Ka pai. Put your hands up and do something. Will you speak out or say nothing? There is so much we have to lose. But if you move like this, take your time and get used to it. No good reason we can't make a change. So get off the fence, it's far too crowded Take a chance now, scream and shout it Now's the time to put your hands up Let's go for it. Thank you.